Good morning, everyone. Welcome to First Congregational Church of Bellingham, United Church of Christ. My name is Davi. It's so good to have you with us this morning. Uh, whether you're joining us in person uh, on our bigger balcony, which is what we call our online worship gathering, or even watching the service later on, it's a blessing to have you as part of this community, however you gather with us. I have just a few announcements uh, to begin our worship together. Uh, first off, we're very excited to welcome back Reverend Sharon Benton today. Yay! Wow. I think I heard some people cheering from home. That was delightful. Um, uh, we'll have just a very simple uh, prayer of blessing on her return at the end of our announcements. Um, and then uh, we'll have a more, what's the, extensive uh, celebration. Uh, if you can join us after worship, you can, um, if you're here in person, you can just head out to the parking lot. Uh, if you want to drive over, uh, you know, throw off your pajamas and throw on some other pajamas and, and, and come over here. Um, we'll have popsicles and prayer. So there's a bunch of popsicles for everybody. You can eat popsicles at home if you want, I suppose. Um, but we'll also have little cards to write prayers and blessings for Pastor Sharon. The idea is um, it's going to be another six or seven years until uh, Sharon's next sabbatical. And so... Um, well, hang on. There's... So, so as uh, inspiration, as sustenance, as encouragement in those in-between times, um, I, we'd like to have a box of prayers, a little box of prayers for Sharon in her office so she can just reach in and pull one out at random and see a kind word from Ted or Allison or Dorothy or whoever. Um, so, um, if, and if you, uh, if you can't be here today but would like to send a prayer, you can uh, mail us one on a little card or you can uh, email them to davi at fccb.net, and I'll write them out nice and put them in. Um, let's see, coming up, we are making some meal kits for Family Promise. As you may know, Family Promise is one of the ways we support families experiencing homelessness. Um, for a while, we would uh, make food and, and bring it over, but uh, now we're doing meal kits so families can choose what they want to cook for themselves. You can sign up to bring ingredients online. There's more information in the Friday email. Or you can sign up on that um, big blue piece of tag board in the, um, in the narthex area outside the sanctuary if you're here in person. Um, yeah, more details about that um, online in our Friday email. Um, you can always sign up for that office at fccb.net. Or if you'd like a fancy printed out copy, um, there's a couple at the welcome desk in the back there. I guess it's not that fancy. It's just printed out. OK. Um, <laughs> Let's see. Um, also in that Friday email, we're gearing up for fall program, kind of program year events. Um, there's a couple of book clubs that are going to be meeting soon. Um, there's educational activities and a lot more. So um, get in the loop if you can. Um, if you're here in person, we'd love for you to sign in and let us know you're here. Um, you can share uh, if you have a new address or something like that. There's a red folder at the end of your pew, and you can pass that down. Probably there's a cool little golf pencil in there. Um, or you can use your own pen or your laser vision. I don't know. OK. Um, I'm glad Sharon's back. I'm really losing my touch on announcements. Um, I want to give such a um, celebration, a congratulations, a thank you to everyone who is a part of Creation Care Camp this week. Um, if you're here in person, you've seen some of the lovely art up on the glass in the back of the sanctuary, this awesome river and um, full of life kind of poster over here, all kinds of stuff. Um, we had young people, children, um, we had uh, folks helping out. Thank you so much to all of those folks. I think we'll hear a little bit more about that at our time with children, but just hooray, what a great event. The last announcement is our most important. No matter who you are, no matter where you are on life's journey, no matter how long it's been since you were here last, whether it's your first time in this community or your 1,000th time in this community, you are welcome in this place. You are God's beloved. Thanks be to God. Before we ring our bell, I want to invite up uh, Pastor Sharon for a, a time of blessing. It is so good. 
It is so good um, to see all of you. A lot of familiar faces, a lot of new faces to me. Uh, folk who are online, I'm so grateful that you are there too. I can't wait to connect. Um, I wanted to say, if, if you watched the midweek message video that I shared, one of the things that I said is, there is no way for me to encapsulate this sabbatical period into one sentence or one description. And so I hope we get to share um, throughout the next few months uh, more of that. I'm still hearing some of what happened with you all over the summer, and I'm excited to hear more of that as well. I really want to connect with all of you, so please send me your emails, give me your phone calls, um, and we will find a time to get together. Yeah. Thank you, Sharon. And I, for one, just um, want to appreciate the wisdom and care that Sharon's brought throughout this sabbatical process and that the congregation has brought um, to hold the wisdom, to hold the space for rest and renewal, but also to expect that we're going to learn from this process not just now, but in the months and even years to come. Um, so we have a little blessing to go with that. Um, when Sharon finished, uh, uh, when, when Sharon, uh, uh, be, right before Sharon went on sabbatical, um, she ritually took off her stole, which is one of the symbols of ordained ministry in our tradition, and put it here on the communion table. Um, there's a stole here now, and as part of this blessing, she'll put that back on. She's been our pastor throughout, but she's been our pastor in a particular way, this sabbatical, um, kind of removed from the community. Now she's returning to the fullness of community, and we'll mark that with these prayers. A question for you in the congregation, whether you're at home or in person or even watching this later, I invite you to consider. Will you welcome back the Reverend Sharon Benton as she returns from sabbatical? Will you continue to hold her in prayers, learn from her wisdom, and grow in response to the invitations of her leadership? Will you make space for her continuing ministry, her continuing rest, and her continuing growth? Together, we will, God being our help. And Sharon, will you celebrate your return to ministry in this place? Will you find space to share the wisdom gathered in the midst of your sabbatical and to hear anew how the Spirit is freshly leading this congregation? Will you continue to minister with love, to attend to your own rest with diligence, and to serve the Spirit in justice and peace? I will, God being my help. May God bless us all as we continue to journey together in this sacred ministry. Amen. Amen. to see you all. Good morning. Um, please rise as you're able and join with me. Um, rest and return, work and Sabbath. Sometimes renewal happens in community. This is a learning we, re we remind one another as we gather.
We come now to a time in our worship to uh, share the peace of God with each other. Um, you can stay standing if you like. Um, if you're here in person, you can uh, tap elbows. You can share the peace however feels safe to you. Um, you can say, the peace of Christ be with you. Um, if you're at home, you can share with the folks around you. You can text your friends. If you're here in person, you can uh, pull up the Facebook feed and comment to the folks who are at home and have a whole cross-platform peace-sharing situation there, um, to use the technical term. But what I'll say now to you is, may the, may the peace of Christ be with you. Amen. Oh, and you can come up to this microphone and share peace at home. I for missed it. Peace be with you. Bigger balcony, folks. of Christ be with you. Peace be with you in the balcony. And with all of you. to get comfortable, to take a deep breath if you like, whatever puts you in a spirit of prayer. And I invite you to join me in this time of prayer. God, thank you for those moments that feel like homecoming. When we see beloved friends or colleagues we haven't seen for a while, when we're back in places that feel restoring, changed but familiar, growing but nurturing too. Thank you for those moments. And God, we pray also for those times that feel like unrest, like unwelcome spaces of disillusionment, unkindness when we and our people are scattered, God. Come once again among us. Restore us. Renew us. Teach us. God, we pray for everyone who is in the midst of grief. Holding grief for pets who have died, for lost human loved ones but grief also for a lost job or a lost opportunity, a relationship that is broken. God, be with all of us in the midst of grief. Tend to our wounds. Guide our steps towards the long and faithful work of healing, even as we continue to hold love for those we grieve. Hold their presence in our hearts and memories and our very bodies. God, we pray for everywhere in this world where there is violence, especially this week in Ukraine, in Somalia, but in so many other places too, in big, visible ways and in small, subtle, scary ways, God. 
Be with all of those who experience violence. Bring healing, bring protection, bring safety and rest. God, for all of us whose hearts are ready, give us courage. God, for all of us whose hearts are broken, give us care. God, for all of us whose hearts are weary, give us Sabbath. We pray these things and also we offer up to you what we hold in our hearts and our bodies and our minds. Hear our prayers, God, out loud or in silence as we offer them up to you as a community. God, we offer these prayers in your many names and in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray like this. Our parent, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So I just want to say that I'm glad we're reading this scripture this morning and not the scripture that I thought we were reading. Um, I'm dyslexic, and so when I first read the scripture, it was Luke 10, and if you look at it, it's a woe unto you scripture. And I didn't want to say woe on one of my first Sundays back after Bert, has, Bert left us. So here we are with a positive and uplifting scripture, which I'm much th more thankful for. <laughs> um, and this, this particular scripture, oddly, is one that um, Bert, for those of you that don't know, Bert Miller is my spouse of many years, and she passed away about a month ago. And this scripture was one that she was challenged with a lot because she thought you should be able to reach out and give on the Sabbath as well as any other day, and she was lectured for some of the things that she used to do on Sundays way back when, so, so this was all appropriate. So here we go. Um, <laughs> Luke 13, verses 10 through 17, and I am reading from one of the best Bibles, which is one of the children's Bibles we have here in the church. So Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. A woman was there who had been disabled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and couldn't stand up straight. When he saw her, Jesus called her to him and said, Woman, you are set free from your sickness. He placed his hands on her, and she straightened up at once and praised God. The synagogue leader, incensed that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, responded, There are six days during which work is permitted. Come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath day. The Lord replied, replied Hypocrites. Don't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from its stall and lead it out to get a drink? Then isn't it necessary that this woman, a daughter of Abraham, bound by Satan for 18 long years, be set free from her bondage on the Sabbath day? 
When he said these things, all his opponents were put to shame, but all those in the crowd rejoiced at all the extraordinary things that he was doing. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. It's story time, and that's a good time for children who are here to come up a little bit closer to see what's going on. I want, you'll probably want to see about this hat. And if you're watching online, this is a good time for you to get a little closer and kind of pay attention because we've got a story going on. Now, I bet that you have already noticed that I have on a special hat today. I wore a special hat today because this has been a special week. We had creation care camp this week, and we studied the air, and we studied the insects, and we learned about the water and the creatures that are in the water. We even learned about a special dog that can sniff out orca poop. And we learned about trees and about taking care of the parks here. And we learned about animals and all sorts of other things. And we read the stories of our people, stories about how a human was created out of humus and formed out of the very earth and how, how uh, that human got the opportunity to name animals all the way through. There were lots of things that happened. So I wanted to wear a very special hat today, and you probably know a little bit about this hat. Do you know what I have in my hat? Okay, it isn't quite the same as the story. I'm just going to tell you in advance. I have thing one and thing two. If you know the story, you know that the cat in the hat didn't ever have thing one and thing two in his hat. They came in a great big box in the story, and in the cat in the hat comes back, that's another story, he has in his hat little cat A, and little cat A has little cat B, and little cat B has little cat C, and it goes all the way through the alphabet, all the way down to little cat Z. That's not the story we're talking about today. We have a long tradition in our family and in our family of faith about wearing special hats on Sunday. Now, sometimes we forget some of those old traditions, but for thousands of years, our people have thought it was very important to have a day that we set aside as a special day, and one of the ways of doing that was to wear a special hat for when we were praying to God. Now, I'm not wearing a kippa today, I just thought I'd tell you, but I do have a special hat for a special day, because it is a special day. And Jesus' followers saw him one time when people were saying, Jesus, you're not getting this whole thing about special days right, because you're supposed to be laying back and relaxing, and here you are healing somebody who has had a sickness for a very long time. But Jesus said, remember, all of the traditions and the rules and stories are for the people, not for the purpose of keeping people back, but for making people free. And so Jesus reminded them that you don't always have to have the right hat or show up at the right time if you really pay attention to people. And that's what we want to learn together. Can we say a prayer too? great and wondrous God. You surprise us in so many ways, and you surprise us with the asks and the requests of the people we love. Help us to listen carefully in love on all the days of our lives. In your holy names we pray. Amen.
I was having nightmares all last week about preaching. <laughs> but here we are, and y'all faces look kind. I hope. <laughs> okay, so I already said it is impossible to tell you all of the emotional and soul-filling experiences that I have had on this sabbatical time. It was a continual spiritual journey in which I connected with my ancestors, my mother's mother's family, half Protestants from Germany and half and, and those Protestants from Germany immigrated to Newark, New Jersey. And then the other half were Hungarians um, who were Jewish and immigrated to Manhattan, New York. And by walking in those places, walking in the streets that they lived and going to the cemeteries where their bodies lie, I really experienced in this mystical yet concrete way the God of my ancestors and my God. Today I'll share with you just a tiny tidbit about Grandpa Ernst. Before this summer, I knew very little about my great-great-grandfather, Ernst Wilhelm Theodor Leffler. I had an image of him from my mom's aunt, both this photograph of a dapperly handsome young man with these sharp mustaches. And I also had not just the photograph, but this picture that my aunt had received from her mom, Ernst's daughter, of a worthless scoundrel who supposedly died falling down the stairs of one of his many not-so-secret lovers. In census records, I discovered that in later years, Ernst no longer lived with my second great-grandmother and their 11 children, but with his own mother. What had he gotten himself into? What had he been really like? I wanted to know this man and what he passed down to his youngest daughter, to her daughter, to hers, to me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So although my mom had known which cemetery in Newark many of Ernst's immediate family were buried, I had to sleuth the internet to discover his burial place, which I didn't find until two days before I left for Newark. Some people tried to dissuade us from going to that particular cemetery, saying it was in a bad neighborhood. But I was so determined. I was excited, I was anxious, I was scared, I was ready, and my mom and dad decided to venture with me. Okay, so the volunteer groundskeeper opened the gate, a locked gate, this overgrown cemetery. And even as we were driving through those gates, I still hadn't realized quite what we'd gotten ourselves into. We drove past these tumbled headstones, many half buried as if an earthquake had mounded the earth over and around them and then grass grown like to reclaim even the crumbling memorials and we followed the man around to the back of the almost 37 acres and exited our cars. He pulled out his phone and looked through an app indicating where Ernst's burial plot was, the number and the row. And he said, we're headed into those woods. What kind of shoes are you wearing? I kept looking into those trees back there behind all of those weeds, looking through the underbrush, trying to comprehend what he was saying, and finally through the growth, I could just barely make out some headstones hidden under decades of Earth's reclamation. After about an hour of tramping through, reading names that could still be read and comparing them to his phone's rows and numbers, he pointed to this 
bare bit of earth on the edge of a cleared path and said, it'd be here. That's it. No gravestone. No indication that Ernst had ever been planted in this earth. The volunteer told us that it was likely that my great-great-grandfather had never actually had a gravestone, that many poorer folk didn't. And learning what I'd learned about his death, it was very likely that nobody chose to build one. Disappointment hit me, longing, even grief, that I'd finally found him and I lost him again and seemingly didn't have anything more than I'd started with. Was there even a point to this journey? This was the beginning of my sabbatical. And what had I found? This bare bit of earth. For 18 years, the woman in Luke's story had lived bent over. That's about all we know about her. It's all Luke wrote. In fact, I'm left longing to know more about most Bible characters. What were their names? How had they lived? How had they gotten into this situation? What was the world around them? How were they being treated? For today, we can assume that this woman wasn't just uncomfortable. Otherwise, she would not have been in the story at all. We can assume that Her disability affected her daily experiences. People probably noticed her, a woman bent over like that. And they probably ignored her. Made awkward not knowing how to interact with somebody different from ourselves. Hers was a hard, hard existence. And there's something else that we know. She kept seeking God. She was at the synagogue. We might assume that she was not there to be healed at all, but to pray and study and worship. And this particular Sabbath, she became an object lesson for Jesus. The Common English Bible that Stacy read from a little while ago translates Jesus' words as, Woman, you are set free from your sickness. The King James Version interprets, woman, thou art loosed, liberated. That's the Greek. She was liberated, set free, loosed. How many times over those 18 years has she visited the synagogue on the Sabbath, seeking God, seeking rest, seeking something that would give her spirit an inkling of connection with God and the people around her, some liberation of the things that held her. Maybe she found that freedom every single time she walked through those doors, and so she kept going back. A place that she was free to be her full self, Free to cry if she felt like it. Free to laugh. Yet I imagine that there were also moments in those 18 years that she felt far, far away from the divine. Maybe even wondering, what is the point of this search? My spouse Jamie's and my house is being painted this week. And of course, it came up with the foreman that we are both pastors. Soon after that revelation, the foreman paused his generally joking demeanor to reveal my dad just died a few months ago, and I'm still grieving. And sometimes, he said, it feels like God is so far away. We chatted a little bit more about that sense of distance from God. And then he said something like, but that's why there are people like you who I can tell that to. And you can be a little bit of that closeness for me. I don't have to be joking and happy all the time. 
And folks like you can make me feel like I'm a little less alone. I just stopped, taken by complete surprise at the turn of this conversation in my backyard. <laughs> yeah, I thought, yeah, we can be that for one another. I believe that we can be Christ's hands and feet and arms of liberating embrace, Christ's touch and words, woman, you are set free. Those things can come through our fingertips and our voices. That volunteer cemetery groundskeeper who generally led my family through, or generously led my family through the trees and underbrush, counting graves and comparing names to his phone. He took a lot of time and effort to lead us to our destination. Yes, he said, in there, through the brush, get your tramping shoes on. But he also stayed with us to the end of that part of our journey. Like the woman in Luke's story, there are times when I felt closer and farther away from finding that connection to family, that connection to God. And I imagine that you have had similar experiences. Maybe right now you are in that space of God being so far away, you don't even know if there is a divine existence. Maybe you are so close that you feel that bubbling up in your spirit. Maybe you're somewhere in between. The spiritual journey that we're on is like that. It's, it's like a labyrinth walk where as you follow the path, sometimes you seem really close to the center and still there might be a long, long path to go before you have that moment of soul healing, of liberation. Thank God there are groundskeepers who go with us. Thank God there is a congregation who is with us when our loved ones die, who walks with us when we're journeying through cancer and through other illness, who celebrate with us when there is the birth of a new child, who will celebrate with us when we transition and come out as who God made us to be. Thank God that there are hands and feet and this liberating embrace Thank God that the divine is not far away, but near, encouraging us on this journey of faith through one another. This community, First Congregational United Church of Christ, is meant to be one of those places. Whether you come here on Sunday morning, for worship or some other time during the week or tune in online, you are the ones who are present to do the welcoming, the warming, the caring, the Christ work. Sometimes you're the giver. Sometimes you're the receiver. It is very likely that I will never know exactly what Grandpa Ernst passed down to me through his daughter, her daughter, and her daughter. But that search for him, it led me to this tumble-down and lovingly cared-for cemetery in Newark, New Jersey. It led me to this generous groundkeeper who guide us through difficult terrain I met Christ in him, a bit of healing, a bit of liberation. May we all keep seeking. May we keep showing up for Sabbath. May we keep walking the labyrinth of this faith as liberators and liberated alike. Thanks be to God. Amen.
was really beautiful thank you um so I had um we were shorthanded this week to for to have people do liturgy and I just said oh I'll do it and I kind of didn't think about what that meant um I was back in the church the Sunday after Bert had passed and I've not been back here since um so it's a little overwhelming and I apologize so I thought I would get up here and I would just say something about all the things we do because that's what we say, right? And um, 
Then all of these thoughts came running through my head, and I thought, okay, well, I guess I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about connection. So connection is this, and let me first start by saying that um, it, this, these things were done not because Bert was special, and she is, and it's not because I am special. It's because of the connection of the folks in this church, and so the three days before Bert had passed away, our pastors were not here. Sharon was on sabbatical, and Dobby was at a conference, and all of a sudden, all these people started coming up out of the woodwork. Um, our daughter had a play, and Bert was desperate to get to that play, and she could no longer walk that far. And somebody just called out of the blue and said, I stopped by the church, and I got a wheelchair, and um, I'll meet you there. And then people showed up at Maddie's play that I know would never sit through a high school production of Mamma Mia. <laughs> so thank you all. It was very good. It was very good. And so... Um, but people just came, you know, and um, the day that Bert had to go to hospice house, we did not know that was the day that Bert had to go to hospice house, and people showed up, and they brought communion and sprinkled her with water, and there was joy and laughter, and somebody came just to um, tell, say thank you to her about something that she had done. All of these connections, right, that we have, you guys have sent letters and cards and notes. In a hospice house when I was with Bert at four in the morning, I don't know what you all are up doing at four in the morning, but I was looking at Facebook and somebody just posted that, you know, they're here and I didn't feel alone because I knew in that room was God and people in the church and we were together. The day that Bert, um, um, died, people came in um, to the hospice house and, you know, Ted stayed with Bert so I could take Maddie home and, and um, people came in, um, helped me put lotion on Bert's feet and carry her into the sun and do all of these wonderful things because of connection. Just people showed up. I didn't call anybody. I didn't ask anybody. You guys were all there. And then when Bert passed, it was so hard for me to see her like she was. And Carol and Robin appeared. And they carried a load that maybe I should have done, but wasn't strong enough to do. And that's been connection. And as the days have gone by, they suck. <laughs> they just suck. And I feel connected, and so I'm thankful. So why do we give to this church? It's not because of all the beautiful, wonderful things that the church does. It's not because of all the ways that we reach out to the community. It's, it's not because, or should I say, it's not only because of all of those things, but it's because of connection. And that connection is available to each one of you guys here, each one of you at home. It's not, again, because we're special. It's because this church is. So that's why we give. Thanks, guys.
first, popsicles. I will go directly outside. You'll find me there with a popsicle. I hope to see y'all there. You folk at home as well. Uh, second, Jesus said to the woman, you are set free. You are liberated. And she celebrated that. May you hear those words sometime this week in some way through some part of creation, may you hear God speak to you, you are liberated. And may you enact that for others. That is our call, dear friends. You are set free. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.